down here. We're going to have to turn off. Okay, that's just a pull off. All right. I'm going to go over here and make the adjustments. You make sure nobody gets that power back on. Not yeah, great. disaster. If the power would have been turned back on while that guy was still inside the machine. Well, what? Hey, didn't you see the sign? It's working on the machine. What sign? I don't see a sign. You think you're doing the right thing by packing up a sign. You would think that would be enough, right? Well, it's not. In today's workplace, the solutions are more complicated than that. Many machines we use contain residual hazardous energy, even after the power has been turned off. And some types of equipment may be powered from different sources, or a backup generator may kick in after the main power source has been disabled. Each year, many injuries, and yes, even deaths, occur due to accidental or unexpected restarting of equipment or failure to control stored hazardous energy. Because there is an almost constant need to perform maintenance, servicing, or repairs of the equipment we use in the workplace, there must be a procedure in place to protect employees from coming in contact with hazardous energy. Now, fortunately, there is. The procedure is called Lockout Tagout. Lockout Tagout is a procedure to control the release of hazardous energy and a system to protect against the accidental restarting of equipment while maintenance or servicing is being performed. Locks are used to control the switches, valves, or controls on equipment. And tags used to communicate information, such as what is happening, who is working on the equipment, and when the work will be done. There are two groups of people in your facility who will be involved in lockout tagout program. They are authorized employees, or those approved to lock and tag equipment, and affected employees those who operate or work the equipment. Also, a successful lockout tagout program includes having a written set of procedures available for employees. By following the proper procedures for locking and tagging equipment, you'll protect yourself and your co-workers from hazardous energy. Hazardous energy comes in a variety of forms. It might be electrical, pneumatic, hydraulic, fluid, gas, or mechanical. Safety devices or guards often have to be removed to perform service or maintenance. If you haven't controlled the hazardous energy, you could receive an electric shock, be exposed to chemicals or gases, or pulled into or crushed by the moving part of the machine. By de-energizing the machine and safely controlling the stored energy, you can minimize the risk to yourself and others. To control hazardous energy, the first step is to isolate it. You can do this by using energy isolating devices. This physically prevents the transmission or release of energy. Good examples of these devices are electric circuit breakers, disconnect switches, line valves, and mechanical blocks. Push-button switches, selector switches, and other control circuit devices are not adequate to isolate energy. Why? Because these can easily be reactivated or turned back on by someone. Once you've identified the energy isolating devices, next step is to control them. This is where lockout tagout comes in. Locks and tag are examples of energy control devices. 
These are placed on energy isolating devices to prevent them from being engaged. Placing a lot the isolating device physically prevents anyone from energizing the system. Some equipment is need to accept a lock, like this. Others are not and may have be modified. You can also get equipment from suppliers that makes it simple to securely lock many standard types of energy controls. It's a good idea to have a variety of these devices available on the job. For example, these allow you to lock turn valves on water and chemical pipes, and they're available in a variety of sizes. To lock a circuit breaker without built-in locking capabilities, use one more of these devices. This kind fits securely on handle valves for gas lines. They're all made in a variety of sizes. This one will accept multiple locks. You can add more locks by daisy chaining them together. Also, each employee must be provided with their own lock and matching key. Never, I repeat, never share or exchange locks and keys. It's much too easy for a mix-up to happen. You can make the locks more easily identifiable by color coding locks for each person or group. Some types of energy controls may require you to use a mechanical blocking device like chain blocks. Make sure that it does the job though and isn't giving you a false sense of security. It's also important to use tags. A tag tells who placed the lock and serves as a visible reminder that this equipment is shut down. Tags must be easy to read and understandable. The best tags are pre-printed and uniform in color, size, and shape. And they should also be durable to prevent accidental removal. So remember, one lock and key per person, make tags easy to read, and attach them so they can't be accidentally removed. Now let's run through the procedures for performing a lockout tagout. Be sure to follow these steps in order. Don't skip ahead, as each step prepares you for the next. Keep in mind that the same steps should be followed no matter what the machine or equipment. And remember, a lockout tagout should only be performed by authorized employees or those trained in the work to be done and the lockout tagout procedures. Step one, preparation before starting work on the equipment. Before servicing or installing equipment, you must answer these four questions. What is the type and amount of energy source on the equipment? What are the potential hazards related to the energy source? What steps are necessary to control the energy source? And who needs to be notified the equipment will be shut down for service? Once you have this information, notify all affected employees a lockout procedure is about to begin and that the equipment will shut down service. You should also explain why the shutdown is happening. Now, move on to step two. Control the energy source. Locate all the energy sources. Remember, many machines have multiple sources or have backup systems that come automatically. Make sure you locate all of them before you proceed. Then, shut down the equipment by following the company safety procedures and or manufacturer's instructions. An orderly shutdown keep you and other employees safe when the equipment is de-energized. Once the machinery is shut down, isolate the equipment by locating and operating all of the energy isolating devices. And this might mean shutting off a circuit, closing valves, disconnecting process lines, and putting plugs. Now you need to attach the lock and tag. Place the lock on the isolating device so it's held in the off or safe position. Keep in mind you may need a variety of locks to fit different mechanisms. Add the tag making sure that it's secure and can't be easily removed. After locks and tags have been applied, you must control any stored energy left in system. This is very important, since energy contained here can be just as dangerous as when the system is fully energized. This energy can be stored in springs, elevated machine parts, rotating flywheels, hydraulic systems, air, gas, steam, and water pressure. Capacitors and electrical equipment can also contain a deadly electrical charge. Make sure you've investigated all the potential sources of energy. Follow all procedures that manufacturer suggests and take the time to do it right. 
Now, test the equipment to verify that the energy state is zero. Verify that the machine equipment is properly isolated and that all the hazardous energy has been safely controlled. And make sure that everyone is out of harm's way before verification. Try to start the machine up or turn on a switch, whatever it takes. Verify that everything has been done to prevent re-energizing the system. If start switches are used, turn them to the off or neutral position. Once you have verified the energy state is zero, you can begin working on the equipment. When the work on the machinery or equipment is complete, and you're ready to turn the equipment back on. You'll need to follow safe startup procedures. Again, follow these steps in order. It's just as critical as when you apply the controls. First, prepare the startup. Inspect the work area for tools or parts that may have left behind. Something could be pulled into the equipment when it's restarted and cause injury or damage equipment you just fixed. A thorough check around the equipment will prevent this from happening. Also, check for other people in the area that might be affected and make sure to reinstall all parts and safety devices. Then you're ready to move lockout device and tags. Start or re energize the machine or equipment and check to make sure it works properly. Keep in mind that some startups may require more than one person to check for failure. Certain maintenance procedures may require multiple persons to lock and tag. As each person no longer needs the lockout protection, they will remove their lock and the tag. You'll also need to notify affected employees. Let all the employees know that the locks and tags have been removed and the equipment will be restarted. Those locks and tags are there for a good reason. Real people's lives are at stake. Know the procedures for lockout tag out and use them every time. And when you'll need to take off the locks and tags, follow the steps to removing the energy controls. Working around hazardous energy can be safe, but it's up to you to take control, know the rules, and follow the steps to safety.